A very good morning to all our attendees. I am Punita Sabharwal Kapoor, Deputy Editor on Zipanor Media India. Today at this episode of Capital Insider, we have with us an investor who is joining us all the way from Singapore. Let's welcome Mr. Vinny Loria, founding partner, Golden Gate Ventures. Vinny happens to see both sides of the table as he is not only a venture capitalist, but he has been an entrepreneur too. His VC firm has made 50 plus investments still based in Southeast Asia prominent being in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. Golden Gate Ventures is an early stage VC fund focused on internet startups. And to all the startups listening to us out here, this is not a fund you want to be turned down by. Vinny, welcome today on this episode of Capital Insider. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, honored to be uh, invited. So Vinny, before we get down to the Q&A and uh, the final grading, Tell me, how are things there in the pandemic period and how affected is the investment uh, scenario and how soon you think we are going to bounce back? Sure. Uh, so, so uh, good question. So in Singapore, um, uh, it's, it's not, you know, uh, full as normal, kind of like pre-COVID, but uh, definitely, you know, uh, retail businesses, restaurants are open up, people are gathering. Um, our office still kind of mostly work from home, few people going in. Uh, all of my calls uh, these days uh, are on Zoom. Um, no, you know, no real travel. So the big thing was I used to travel every week, Indonesia, Vietnam. So now it's just a lot of Zoom calls. Um, Singapore is always our hub for, for where we invest. Um, so that's kind of what it feels like on the ground. Some markets like Indonesia are not, you know, for our team there, they're, they're not going into the office. Things are still pretty locked down. I think it's going to be a while before that loosens up. Um, you know, the reality is that used to be very uh, early in this uh, pretty, you know, yeah, usefully optimistic that, you know, there's going to be a pretty quick bounce back. But I think what we see is like this, we're probably, we may not even be at the bottom yet. Um, but as a long-term investor, we're okay with that. We're, we're writing checks. We're making investments. The companies we're investing in are, you know, uh, we're, we want to see them grow over the next decade. So whether this lasts six months, one year, or even longer, um, we still have a long-term sort of view. Um, and the big thing that, you know, COVID's done, I mean, it, it's tragic. Uh, I mean, what's done globally, people, economies, uh, and everything. But for startups, there are a few verticals that are basically um, – have 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 grown because of it um and the way i look at it is as a vc we tend to invest in the future uh you know what is the trend five years out ten years out and what COVID has done is essentially compressed a sort of five-year vision that we've had into five months um and so you know we invest in the our doctor a health tech platform two years ago uh that's in indonesia and thailand thinking you know that's going to be a slow sort of grow but th their platform has just been growing so fast in the past few months so you know online groceries education health tech like all of these have um, just blown up online um and so there's a lot of opportunity for startups in this space either existing ones or new companies to start so so like you mentioned you've been investing during the pandemic period as well so has it been follow-on investments in existing companies or you've been looking at fresh investments as well uh, uh both uh, so it, it, you kind of fall into a few different camps so if you are in a again uh, e-commerce, grocery, payments, health, education, you are, you're growing. And a few of our companies in the space are raising money and it is, it's, it's, it's inbound. Uh, investors are knocking on their door being like, we, we want to invest in the space. Now we see you're doing this. Can we write a check? Uh, and one of our companies in the health tech space ha has been turning investors away. They took on one strategic investor and then closed the door to others. Um, so, so yeah, that, that this is follow on. Uh, Golden Gate, we've been doing about one investment per month. Um, so we're also making new investments. Um, you know, the process has changed significantly for us. Um, I look at it as, you know, we invest in people. Um, and even though uh, so many tools to like connect, generally we still like to meet people in person, have conversations across from them. That we've not been able to do. So now we've switched over to, you know, full video sort of calls. It's required us to do a little more different sort of due diligence and spend a little more time on the back network and getting some stories. Um, and what we'll learn over time, you know, if, if there was mistakes that were made or things that we didn't understand because, you know, we evolved one way and now we're doing it different. But as a VC, we have to be progressive and constantly change. So, so 
uh, like you mentioned that uh, it's not like meeting in person. You have been judging people over video conferences, virtual pitches. So how those parameters change as per you when uh, somebody is making a virtual pitch to you? How have uh, parameters changed? Um, so the, that's interesting. The parameters are, are pretty much the same. Um, the conversations tend to be the same. Where we're trying to leverage now is more in the background information. So, hey, uh, this person, you know, used to work at this other company or went to school here. So we're trying to leverage more of our network to get more reference points on someone uh, because we can't rely on, you know, the face-to-face -face anymore. But the parameters in terms of growth rates, uh, you know, attraction, retention, behavior, analytics, all of those have pretty much stayed the same. I would think there's certain industries that will have a certain sort of, uh, you know, again, strong industry, that's good. Now there's industries that are heavily hit travel, for instance. So I think travel for new investment uh, is going to be very hard, uh, you know, pr probably for maybe even two years. And so then what we'd want to see there is what is there something that's complementary to the business? Is there a, a new line of business that's you know going to be helpful uh, during the next year or two? Because I do think it, it'll be a little bit slower to bounce back. So th I guess those would be the different sort of questions that, that we're asking. And any specific qualities which you look for? I mean, uh, I mean, a lot of startups are listening to us right now. When they are making a virtual pitch, maybe four things they should keep in mind? Uh, good question. All right. So, I mean, the old adage of like doing your homework before, like knowing what the investor has invested in, uh, speaking to, you know, they should do their due diligence as well. They should speak to founders that we've invested in, people in our portfolio, get really honest feedback from their colleagues and their peers. So I would do, doing some of that beforehand so you can ask the right sort of questions. Uh, I think that's always very, very helpful. Um, the other thing would be, um, you know, I think when you're actually pitching and you're doing slides in the room, you can read body language a little bit better. Is this going well or not? Um, so just being a little bit more aware of kind of what sort of signals you're, you're getting from somebody uh, on the video screen. And so that's great where you can have a co-founder where they can uh, maybe just be commenting to you like, hey, you know, they seem to be dying off on this. Um, the other thing I think this is a good thing for a pitch, and so probably more so in a in a online uh, virtual sort of thing. But like, have some anecdotes on hand. Uh, you know, think about being like a comedian going on stage. You know, while it looks like you're kind of just riffing, the reality is that that is a hundred percent sort of scripted. And you know, sometimes if they get interrupted, they'll they'll still have like you know default stories that they can come back to 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 use. I would say do the same sort of thing. So in a Zoom call where you think maybe you're kind of losing somebody in, in the slides or in some of the numbers, um, have that anecdote on file. That's an interesting story, compelling, captures somebody's interest, brings them back in. Um, the other thing I might say to change is, yeah, it might not need to be your full hour of slides. Like generally a, a pitch, you're kind of doing it over a full hour of slides. I think that is harder on video that, um, you know, spend a little more time engaging uh, in the beginning of the call. And maybe the idea that, that the slides would be more of like a half an hour. So you're really holding their attention tighter. And then a little time at the end uh, for some more, again, conversational Q&A is probably better. So I would say probably trim the, the presentation a bit. Interesting. So it's not just editors who like listening to great stories. It's investors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I, I mean, it, it's your employees. Like, you know, if you're a CEO, like, you know, the idea that you can lead people and inspire them. Um, yeah, I, I think being a great storyteller uh, is probably one of the most important uh, things for in like any line of business. Okay, okay, sure. So, Vinny, uh, in the time of the pandemic, uh, have there been cases where any of your portfolio companies have undergone uh, any kind of pivots or any kind of transformation they would you, they would have suggested? Uh, yeah, uh, quite a few. Um, and so this is where we spend time. We, we triage the portfolio similar to like a hospital ER room, uh, red, amber, green. Uh, and so for the companies that were critical where it's a vertical really hit by this space, they're going to need to do something different. Uh, I've tried to spend a lot of time with them. So one of our companies in Indonesia, 
was working uh, with um, a lot of offline uh, retail and all of that's you know, gone away and they had a SaaS product. So from research that we were doing in China and in India, models that had uh, evolved, uh, we were able to share some information on some stuff that was more of a online model and they have pivoted into that. So um, some companies, yes, have needed to. Uh, and we've tried to basically do as much research as we could educate ourselves on different models and then share that with our cross portfolio. And as a good investor, what we're tr always trying to do is learn something from one portfolio and share it with another. You know, we're not sharing private numbers, but we're just sharing best practices, lessons learned, mistakes being made. Um, and I think that's the other good thing is that, um, you know, for, for any founders, uh, startups on the call, like the idea of thinking of your investors, your, your board, um, you know, don't, ever think of it as one way of reporting. Uh, it, it should be two way. And so I think it's good to be pretty transparent, like, hey, we're running into an issue here, or this part of the business is, you know, being hurt. Uh, as an inside investor, I, I do spend a lot of time trying to really smoke that out. Like, where are things not going well? Some of our entrepreneurs are very upfront with it, and it makes for a great conversations. Others kind of feel like they need to hide that from an investor. But I look at it as we're a long-term partner. I'm already an investor. W what am I going to do? R you know, run away. I can't take my money. So if you're a little bit more uh, open about, yeah, this is where we're having some sort of difficulty, then we can have a meaningful conversation of, all right, so what's next? Do, do we change something? Is there a different way to approach it? Uh, does there need to be a pivot? Um, and so that, that's where I'll probably spend more time is really trying to get out the, uh, you know, w where are things not going so well and how do we work together on that? Okay. Sure. And how would you look at uh, companies who are uh, looking, or who were looking at diversification at that point in time? Uh, I mean, before the pandemic hit, and now how things shape would shape up in the coming times? Um, in terms of like, so diversification in a few different ways. I've told some of our companies diversify to different countries. So this is where, for a lot of our Indonesian startups, that would never look at Singapore as a market, just in terms of size, in terms of even consumer behavior, it's very different. Um, I've now uh, suggested to some Indo startups, like think about launching a product in Singapore, maybe Hong Kong as well, Taiwan, these other sort of markets that are clearly, uh, you know, weathering this better because of, uh, you know, political decisions, governance, whatever that might be. And so even if it's a small market for you, at least what you're able to show is over the next year that like, hey, we were able to go into a new market. We were able to get, you know, maybe it's not growth that affects the top line, but on this segment, we were really able to grow. We do have a good product. It's, you know, and this proves it that outside of COVID, it, it can really grow. So that sort of diversification to different geographies, that's been uh, one of our recommendations. Um, clearly for some businesses, the idea of, uh, you know, going into a new uh, area. And then my conversations sometimes are, we've had companies that are trying to go into a new area that are still kind of uh, tied to their original DNA. And I, I've even suggested them, like, if you're going to go into the area, just while you may have domain expertise and relationships there, just take a step back. Think of it, completely, if you're starting from scratch, a new area, would you, what would you do? And do you still need to work with the partners, the clients, the customers you currently have, or would you target completely new ones? And again, that is okay. Um, so like sometimes it's valuable to leverage that. Sometimes it could be more valuable for a pivot to kind of start with that blank slate. So um, I also will encourage entrepreneurs to really compare uh, both sort of options. Interesting. So any trends do you see emerging in Southeast Asia post the pandemic and any shifting paradigms you could share? Uh, yeah, so um, there are a lot of services. Uh, so, I mean, globally, health tech and education, which, you know, online telemedicine, online learning like that, that is blowing up and will continue to blow up. Uh, so that, that is a global phenomenon. Locally here in Southeast Asia, I think uh, fintech, insurance tech, we're seeing a lot of innovation still because, you know, people can't go to a physical bank. Uh, people, that's the thing is in like a place like Indonesia, all right, in Jakarta, that's very digital. But the rest of Indo, it still is very in-person, pop-ups, giving cash. So, um, you know, years behind even India in, in that sense. So 
there is a lot of opportunity for innovation in this space around, you know, digital payments um, or lightweight agent models that would allow for maybe some cash or some goods to be delivered because um, there is still some of that. Um, insure tech, insurance, uh, new products being created, new ways of doing collections. We're seeing a lot there. Um, we've definitely seen, and, but this is global, like a number of startups that are kind of tackling like, how do you make, you know, Zoom, Zoom is great, but does Zoom work great for classrooms? No. Does Zoom work great for events and conferences? No. And so there, we're seeing a bunch of innovation in, in new sort of uh, video conferencing tools that are really for these kind of specific verticals. Um, uh, trying to think of what else. Um, there, there, there is a lot. Uh, and I would say everything pretty much is just focusing on, okay, what was traditionally in the real world and, and how do we make that digital now? And while maybe it wasn't ready to be digital yet, you know, back in January, now there, there's clearly a real need for it. I mean, education would be the clearest example. Like while there's been a move to go online, nobody's done full on classes all day online. Uh, so it took something like this to, to make that sort of switch. And now we're seeing a lot of innovation in the space. Any areas, I mean, when we're talking about, again, education, health tech, retail, and e-commerce, I mean, which you think uh, is still uh, has not seen much disruption, and you as an investor would like to see some startups emerging in that area? Um, well, so, I mean, logistics would be then another area that supports a lot of this e-commerce, and that those tend to be very old sort of industries. Um, I would say they have not yet seen lots of disruption yet, but they are like we're investors in Ninja Van uh, in this space. Um, so uh, I think there's on the logistics side, huge, huge amount of opportunity in that space. Like that's that game has not been answered yet. Um, and there's a lot of legacy sort of dinosaurs that probably will not be around, you know, five years out and that gives opportunity for young startups. So I think logistics would be one of them. Um, uh, you know, it's talking about like, hey, people doing more video. The fact is like, there's a lot of uh, engineering resource power that has to go into streaming video live, real time, low latency. So there's also going to be a whole crop of startups that like, you know, maybe Slack is using a third party startup to do some of the video or the audio or something like that. So there's going to be, you know, I was mentioning obviously there's Zoom, but there's these front facing startups for conferences, for classrooms generally they're going to use sit on top of technology on, underneath. So that whole layer wide open right now. Uh, and so for a startup in India it could definitely make a global company from India right now that just has better video streaming, lower uh, latency, better compression, what, whatever it might be, there's just going to be huge demand for that with a lot of tools that sit on top of it. So somebody that focuses on that, uh, servicing other startups in this space. Uh, and that's the old adage of Silicon Valley, uh, when it was the gold rush in the 1840s in the U.S., um, the people that really made the money weren't the people that went out and searched for gold because it was really a few of the larger uh, groups that did well. All the individuals lost money. But by and far, individuals that did really well were the ones selling the pickaxes, the shovels, the, you know, all the gear that everyone that was coming. So I would kind of use that same analogy. So what are the tools, the pickaxes, the shovels that a video conferencing software might need or an education startup might need? That would be a very, very sweet spot to be building some software right now. So, Vinny, uh, you have helped propel your portfolio companies to new level and even unicorn status. So, what makes uh, the startup investments unique? Uh, startups really want to know what's that value add you bring to the table. Uh, as a as a VC, uh, yeah. fair question. So, um, so one, I, I've been through this before. I built two startups from scratch, co-founded two startups, raised money, uh, sold one, <laughs> closed down one, so even been through a failure in Silicon Valley. So I think having the kind of, you know, roll up your sleeves, operational sort of know-how uh, ha has been something that's been helpful and, and allows me to connect a little bit more meaningfully uh, to, to our founders. Um, s second, uh, you know, we 
our brand, Golden Gate Ventures, like Silicon Valley experience. Uh, all uh, a few of the founders who spent time in the Valley, uh, we have a very good network there. We've helped some of our portfolio companies raise from global VC brands that are, you know, in India and China and now uh, Singapore, but had started in the Valley. Um, and so our network there has been helpful. Um, I would say over time, what we've really evolved in has been our regional footprint. Um, we now have offices around Southeast Asia. We have a portfolio on the ground in all the companies, uh, countries we're operating in. They become local partners for us. We have LPs, uh, strategic LPs in each country. They become local partners for us. So I think one thing that we really try to do is help our founders go regional, go into other countries and hire people, uh, make the right sort of intros to some of the conglomerates, the family-owned businesses. Um, I think that's an asset that we're able to offer. Um, and then we have an entire portfolio support team, um, as do some of the, a number of the other global and Silicon Valley based CTs, which is, you know, recruiting, marketing, uh, growth, uh, hacking and things like that. Resources we're able to give out to the portfolio. So given the international footprint, what kind of a cross border movement do you suggest for startups? Um, Good. So this is where I mentioned markets like Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan. I think they have weathered uh, this pretty well. And while they're each like a, you know, Taiwan, Taipei, Hong Kong, Singapore, you can think of those as three different cities, um, that those would be good cities to, to consider um, in terms of hedging the bet. Even if the offering would be quite different, um, it should be something to be considering. Um, and then I think if you're looking at Southeast Asia, a market that's showing a lot of potential right now and has weathered this really well is Vietnam. Uh, and again, it comes down to government and policy decisions that they made very early on um, in terms of lockdown and they didn't allow people like to travel between the cities early on and stuff like that, close the, close the borders. Um, and that's paid off for them. So Vietnam would be an, an, another market. Um, other than that, you know, I look at it as going from, your home market into a new country is really difficult. Uh, like I'm naming these cities as if it's easy, that uh, it's also probably good to know that you're gonna make some mistakes, you're gonna have stumbling blocks. So at the end of the day, whatever country the founders may have some sort of affiliation to, a safety net, people that they already know, that might actually be the most important thing just to demonstrate the capability or the ability to understand how do you open a new market? How do you hire people there? How do you sync them with, uh, you know, the culture of the team and the mission and the vision and all of that? that? That's actually one of the more difficult things. And then if you can get that right, it makes going into other markets much easier. And when we talk about industries uh, like insure tech and data science, I mean, how do you see software is changing in the back alleys of Asia? Uh, yeah, so, uh, that's another, um, so, uh, you know, in places like Indonesia, you, you, the back alleys, so you, they're called warongs, like little shops that basically, which you have in India as well, uh, that are like independently owned. Um, so software is completely cha changing that landscape, um, more so under COVID right now. So one, like how they get their supplies. Um, now it's very common that there, there's dozens of apps uh, in this space where the, the shop owner will basically in the morning uh, open the app and you know take a quick inventory and I need more fresh uh, vegetables or fruit or uh, whatever it might be. And it's like app based. Uh, and then you're kind of like ch clicking on a few things. And then literally later that day or the next day, it gets delivered. Um, very different than previously where they would have needed to go, go somewhere <laughs> and, and uh, kind of place their orders sort of in person um, and then have that delivered. There was kind of an in-between stage where like WhatsApp was being used, but the apps in terms of making the payments, know, knowing if something's available or not, being able to choose something easier, it, it's just so much more efficient. So we're seeing a number of companies in this space for these small little shops that are basically just like somebody would turn to amazon.com, you know, the amazon.com is but for shop owners. Um, so the, that's one area that's taking off. Um, the other is around financing uh, for some of these small little shops or sometimes they're just like the person on the street with a little cart. Um, but they do do, and so we have an investment in uh, Book of Laura, uh, which is doing um, uh, basically financing uh, for these little uh, one, you know, one person shops where they'll know their clientele and they'll say, all right, just pay me at the end of the week. When you get paid, just pay me at the end of the week. And, you know, if you're getting coffee, rice, whatever, I'll kind of mark it down, pay me at the end of the week. I mean, this is how traditional stores have operated 
you know, before modern times, it's, you know, you knew the shop owner, small village, and I'll just keep a little line of credit. Um, but companies like Book Warong and uh, Kafka Book in India and a ton of other companies um, are now digitizing that. And this is changing it because it makes it more efficient. Uh, it means uh, the shop owners are definitely getting paid. Like some of them would feel pressure, like stress, like, oh, I don't want to cause conflict or embarrass somebody. So I won't keep pushing them or I'll just like let it slide. But the fact that it's digital, kind of automatic, it happens in the background. It helps ensure shop owners actually do get paid and that, you know, it doesn't sort of drag on and put on pressure for them because it's not like they have a lot of money to support that as well. So that's on the financing side. Um, uh, payments, uh, the fact that, you know, you have GoPay, GrabPay, and a dozen other payments sort of companies, um, it's allowing them to now uh, accept, you know, di digital payments where uh, we obviously seen trends like in China where it's gone all to Alipay and WeChat Pay. We're starting to see that in places like Indonesia. Um, but these are the sort of tools that these back alley shops are, are using that just did not exist a few years ago. Um, and the last sort of thing I'll add is actually the, the marketplaces that allow them to sell. Uh, like some of these, sometimes um, shops might have more of a, they're creating something. It's not just, you know, reselling a consumer goods, but there, there might be something that they've created, uh, art, uh, clothing, something of uh, boots. We've even seen uh, some of these small sellers, uh, shoes and stuff like that. And now they're able to post on these marketplaces, uh, Tokopedia, and then reach a much, much larger audience. So now the, the, I mean, on the flip side is like, you're, you're not just selling to people nearby, but now you can be selling to the whole country. And uh, when you when you're talking to uh, your portfolio companies, I mean, uh, I know uh, in every investor is uh, at a certain point uh, looking at uh, growth and uh, later on at exit. And now uh, in the current times, every penny is being counted. So how decisive are you in terms of uh, any new approaches they would be taking? I mean, are there new measures uh, you would suggest them to adopt to, to see how it's going to figure out in the coming times? Yeah. Um... Yeah, so I would say if you haven't already adopted, it, it could it, it could be a little too late. Like if you haven't made drastic changes already, um, then it means you may have potentially burned too much and whatever changes now. So this is where we really intervene and we had to like hammer home and I, I, like I sent out emails, but that didn't work. I had to do one-on-one -on -one calls and be like, this is how bad this is going to be. Uh, and it took a while for me to understand that, but then it was clear. But like, the things that we were basically telling, so. Um, one, uh, if you were planning to raise money before year end, like that's going to be, if, and you're in a affected sort of vertical, it's going to be incredibly difficult. So you now need to get, you know, 18 months of runway. You're go figure out how to get 18 months of runway. Obviously easiest thing slash marketing sort of, uh, sales. And that's okay. You, it's okay that you don't have growth. You need to survive. Um, for some companies, they needed to make uh, salary reductions. And I, you know, one company that reduced salaries between 18 to 30% with the founders taking the most. Uh, some companies had to make cuts. Um, and as a former founder, you know, gone through this and then telling our portfolio is like, you don't want to make cuts slowly and over time because some of our founders asked like, oh, we'll do one batch now. And then if it's still bad, we'll do sec second one later in the year. And that's the bad signal because that sends a signal to your team that like, you could be let go at any time. And so if you're going to have to make cuts, then as a CEO driving that ship, take that more conservative route, make, make bigger, uh, deeper cuts now rather than, you know, two or three trickled over time. Cause that doesn't, that kills team morale. Um, other sort of things. Like I, I've seen some cool little hacks, like so many startups use uh, subscription software for, you know, email, Slack uh, services, and you kind of forget what you might be paying for. And if you're a startup, you eat your every dollar, every penny counts. Um, so what they recommended was just cancel your credit cards or freeze your credit cards. So all the subscription software just stops. And now you'll just re opt in for anything you want. And that's a very easy way to like stop that bleed because for some startups, they could literally be paying, you know, $1,000 a month in subscription software. Um, you know, we, we've done partnerships with AWS, Amazon Web Services, which hosts a, a bunch of startups. Um, they've been very flexible, uh, you know, sometimes helping forgive or giving some grants so that, you know, startups don't have to pay some hosting costs. So talk to your hosting provider. Um, what are other creative ways? Um, leveraging, uh, if you do need extra, uh, just spoke to a startup right now, like, Hey, you know, our clients are asking to build this. 
we don't have the engineering resource and we can't hire anybody right now. And my suggestion to them was uh, get some uh, freelancers, some outsourcers. So uh, it's a, something that's not internal core, but it, like an add-on that basically allows their s software to interface with another API. So that's external. So like hire a freelancer. So now you don't have to, it might be a three month project. Maybe you're hiring two or three people part time, but that can be a way of, you know, doing things differently to build the software. Normally, as a uh, startup, you're not hiring freelancers, you're hiring everything in-house. So just thinking differently about it has probably been a lot of our advice. And when we talk about uh, investors per se, and uh, when you go to the market uh, to uh, look, seek the next round of fund for uh, Golden Gate Ventures, how do you think the response is going to be? And uh, would your uh, approach be different in the coming times? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it, uh, the approach would definitely be different. Um, uh, so I think the thing is there's a lot of unknown. And where I'm sort of advising our startups right now is, um, and maybe it's as a former American, or not former, still American, but it's been a decade since I lived there. Um, the uh, U.S. is going through some very trying times, but it is an economy that affects global economies. And we're clearly have a lot of uncertainty. The U.S. this election particularly has a lot of uncertainty in it, and I can very much just see, uh, you know, it getting dragged on in the courts for like three months and like who won and recounts and stuff like that. That sort of uncertainty kills markets. And so there could be worse sort of news, uh, you know, coming from the stock exchanges and stuff like that towards the end of the year. Uh, I do think that is a likely scenario. And so um, then people should be bracing for that. Like the economies could get worse. And then how does that affect, you know, India, Indonesia? Well, you know, sometimes uh, it might not even be a startup, but like very large corporates, they might be borrowing money from like a U.S. bank or an international bank. They might have debt terms that, you know, if the economies or something falls below something that they have to start making debt repayments, or they might have to plan on raising some money at, by this point and they can't do that. Uh, and so then as those large corporates, you know, local domestic sort of companies face some issues, that's going to have a huge trickle down effect. Um, employees being laid off and then consumers don't have the same sort of spending power, uh, you know, software needing to be cut. Um, for a lot of our B2B SaaS software, um, I was really pushing on them earlier on to like just expect that you're going to have some clients that don't pay you. And we did see that. We saw – you know, some B2B SaaS software startups that were selling to other startups that were well-funded. And those startups have either, you know, gone to a third of the size or some have now even fully closed up. And then a uh, payment channel that you were expecting and back money that's owed, it just disappears. And so you could expect more of that to happen from some like larger sort of corporate set um, you might've thought as being a safe bet. So yeah, my, on that sense would be, I don't think there's a, safe sort of answer now, but I, I am still advising that it, it, there could be potentially stormier waters ahead. Okay. Yeah, okay. we're still investing. Again, it's a long-term sort of investor, long-term partner. I'm optimistic what the next decade would look like, but when we hit rock bottom, how fast the recovery is, I, I, that I don't know. Okay, okay, sure. And the focus areas is going to remain the same, or uh, would you look at uh, some different venues as well? Uh, so, I mean, focus area in terms of country. So for us, it's Southeast Asia, ASEAN, that will stay the same. In terms of verticals, that changes. I would say we, we will have themes, theses that kind of, um, I would say maybe on like a six month sort of cadence. So this has nothing to do pre post COVID or anything, but generally we're, we're trying to get ahead of the curve. We're trying to go out and find, uh, you know, founders, um, before it's, you know, it's obvious and it's a trend. Um, and we do a lot of global research and we have a proprietary database of GGD brain that helps us with that. Um, so, so the verticals, yes, but those will definitely change. Um, and that's why some of the verticals I mentioned earlier, that's what's popular right now. And in six months that, that, that could be different. Okay. Okay. Sure. Interesting. And there's another focus area uh, your venture has on female founders, right? So tell us more about yeah. that. Sure. Uh, no, uh, appreciate that question. So for, for me, I, I think a lot of it's around diversity. Um, if you 
look at the Valley. Um, Kaufman, uh, the foundation did a, a study a few years back, and they found 51% of all founders in the Valley are foreign born. They're not from the US. Uh, and it, it, people forget about like giant companies like Google and YouTube and um, I mean, it, it's just a really big list. Like, uh, and so for me, what that really says is Silicon Valley, it's not just because you're American that you build a company. It's because Silicon Valley is this magnet for international talent, people with diverse backgrounds yeah. being drawn there. And that's where they create magic. I think the same. And so for women, uh, for, for founders, we have a fast track program. And it basically says that if there's a uh, female co-founder, uh, there's a checkbox and then they're fast tracked, which means they can be brought up in a partner meeting uh, earlier uh, with like less sort of requirements and kind of can be discussed. And it's kind of highlighted uh, that this is a, um, uh, you know, female co-founded company or female founded CEO. Um, and for us, that sort of diversity, that's going to be different sort of innovation, different sort of product, different sort of team building. We really, really like that. Uh, if you look across our team, uh, I mean, gender uh, uh, split 50-50, um, but uh, just backgrounds, uh, religions, the countries, um, it, we, out of 18 people on the team, we have eight different passports. So it's just a very, very diverse team. So it's not that we set out to do that in the beginning, but I've now learned that that is where the magic happens. Any insights you could share in terms of uh, the kind of pitches which have been coming during the time of pandemic? I mean, uh, are there female founded companies more or male founded companies or any uh, segments or sectors you could uh, throw some light on? Um, that I, I, my, I don't have the hard data, but my feeling is that that ratio has not changed, uh, but that ratio is not good. There are way more companies that pitch with uh, you know, all male founders um, that uh, still very much encourage, uh, you know, uh, seeing more of that. And that's hence why we'll, we, we try to think of like, yeah, what are the ways that we can make sure um, that we're not just kind of following the status quo, but can kind of bring something up to the surface. Um, so I, I haven't seen that uh, ratio change because of the pandemic, but I do think, you know, we've been doing this for 10 years that ratio has definitely changed today uh, versus, you know, when we first started, um, but it's, it's still very far off. And I would like to see that be uh, way, way more uh, even. It should be 50-50. There's no reason for that. Um, so I, I think the other thing that you're seeing is like, if I look across our portfolio, um, just uh, females, women in, to in top management, CXO sort of level roles, that so maybe they weren't the co-founders, but that is really increasing uh, over the past few years. Um, and so to me, that that's that next generation. Like, you know, the, a lot of times a founder might have been part of a, a high growth startup before. And so now if they're in that position, they're learning like the ability to go out and raise capital, build that team is going to be much, much, much easier. Um, and so one thing we do that, so we have a recruiter uh, on uh, in Golden Gate, uh, and every time he sends a, you know, a batch of uh, candidates, there always has to be at least one woman. Uh, so with the whole idea is that's another way now we can kind of, uh, you know, diversify it within the portfolio. Um, and so the founders may, may not even realize that. Sometimes I, I will mention that, like, hey, you have an all-man team, um, it, it would be good to get some you know, diversity of opinion here in terms of the product, in terms of demographic and audience. Uh, so sometimes I do mention that, but other times we just do it uh, passively just to make sure that people are, are kind of giving that to consideration. I, I'm not aware of other VC firms, that, at least in Southeast Asia, that do that. Talking about online entertainment, I mean, uh, any trends do you see emerging in uh, the space? Uh, it was muted first, or dropped out for a second. Any online trends in what space? Online entertainment space. Oh, online entertainment. Uh, yes, uh, so, quite a lot there. Um, so we we're investors in Low Motif, uh, which is basically a TikTok competitor. You know, short form music videos. Um, the big difference that they have is they allow people to re-edit. Uh, so it's almost like it's like being a DJ and kind of mixing other people's videos. Um, but because of everything that's been happening with TikTok being banned in India, potentially being banned in the U.S., they've seen phenomenal sort of growth over the past few months. Um, they were seeing growth 
before even any of the band being uh, TikTok being banned because people are being at home. So therefore they're creating more content and sharing it. Uh, so Loma Fee was growing, I would say stronger uh, as soon as lockdown started happening in the U S so their strongest markets right now are North and South America, even though it's a company that started in Singapore. Um, uh, what else are we seeing in the entertainment space? Uh, we did an investment in go play. Uh, so Gojek launched a streaming video service um, that's going head to head with Netflix in Indonesia, but they're doing really well for two reasons. Number one is local content. Um, you know, people do want to see local content. It's not just translating. Like people want local stories and local dramas and local co comedies. Um, even think in the U S um, you know, some of the top shows, uh, the office, for instance, that was a, uh, a UK show that uh, then in the U S they localized it. They, you, you know, American actors, American uh, comedy. Um, so that's what we're starting to see. And so go play even, um, they got the rights to do Gossip Girl, very popular show in the U.S. And so the rights that they got was to film it with an all Indonesian cast in Bahasa, different sort of storyline, and that's doing very well. So localized content has been huge for them. But the second thing is payments. Um, in places like Indonesia, Vietnam, collect Philippines, collecting subscription payments is, you know, when people don't have a credit card is actually very difficult. Um, but Go, GoJack, which, you know, is, has GoPay, which they even spun out, is the strongest wallet uh, in Indo. That supports subscription billing. Uh, and so now their video streaming service uh, does work with subscription billing. And this is where the other players, HBO Go, and, and folks have just not been able to get any sort of traction. Um, what else are we seeing in entertainment? Uh, a lot of audio uh, podcast uh, that really had a resurgence there. Again, people are at home uh, spending just more time uh, not out and about. So it's a way of digesting content. Um, yeah, uh, we have a yet unannounced investment that we've done that specifically focuses on Asian content globally, and it's really to highlight Asia stories globally. They have an office in uh, Singapore, an office in the U.S., um, and th they're doing very well. Uh, it's a self-startup right now. So uh, that's, I mean, that's another thing. I think Asia, like culture, like for a few years now, especially like India culture, Bollywood is definitely, food has you know, definitely been you know, top of mind in the U.S. Now we're seeing like K-pop and stuff like that. Um, I think like the next you know, decade or even 20 years, um, I, I think this is the part of the world that will really be exporting a lot of culture that people are interested in digesting. So now these sort of companies that are helping that go across borders and how do you promote that, distribute that, and get partnerships, um, that's another area that is uh, open for innovation. Those are some good insights. Before we uh, conclude, uh, we have an audience question uh, from uh, Prachi Jakta, and she's asking, "What is what do you think are the best steps to approach good investors?" Uh, what are the best steps? So, um, doing so, do your homework. And so, what does that mean? Is all right. Find out who the best investors are. Put that a list. What makes them the best? So then talk to their founders. What do their founders say? What sort of value do they add? Um, look at their portfolio. Have they been investing in spaces similar to yours? That's generally a good thing. I don't think I knew that when I was an entrepreneur. I, I think I thought like, oh, they've, um, I mean, if it's a competitor, then, then you don't want to talk to them. But if it's in your space or kind of upstream or downstream of you, it means they have knowledge of that space and they would actually be interested. Um, you know, the thing is, when I was an entrepreneur, I used to think like, oh, I have a good idea. Therefore, any investor I meet should be backing me. But the reality is um, investing is very, uh, <laughs> has a lot of flavor to it. So really kind of understanding like, are, are, is this a good fit both ways is important. Uh, I mean, so easily it would be like, get yeah, geography, do they invest in, uh, in India? Are they uh, actively investing on the ground stage? Is that aligned? Uh, you know, sort of verticals. Those are very easy sort of top level questions. But then you can start to get a little bit more minute in terms of like, what are their expectations, uh, you know, to be a board member? Um, how much, uh, how often do they think you should be raising? How fast should growing? Is there alignment there? So those are the questions you can ask some founders. Um, other ways to approach an intro. Like anyone can email me and I'm definitely going to read it or somebody on the team's going to read it. But Generally, it's better coming through somebody I know because um, I look at it. That's a, that's a filter. 
Um, and I definitely know that the best way to get an intro is through a founder already in the portfolio because the founders are going to filter very well. Um, they definitely get a lot of requests for intros. They don't intro everybody. They're only going to intro things that they know are going to kind of fit our thesis and mandate, and they're going to know that best. Uh, they might even know that better than our LPs. Um, so I think a founder intro is probably the best way. Um, the other thing is down to the messaging. This may be different for every investor, but for me, I want it kept simple. I, you know, however you would descri describe your company to your mom, like that's how it should be descri described to me. I don't need buzzwords. Uh, I just need to know what is it that you're offering and who are you serving and why are you different? Like, and that you can say in literally two to three sentences. Um, and I will tell you, like when I get really long winded text emails, um, I kind of gloss over that. And I have a feeling that probably a lot of investors do it. Like you'd have a better chance of grabbing my attention with like, two to three sentences, um, then, you know, three paragraphs. Um, yeah. And then in today's day and age, the fact that you're not going to be like running into investors as much in conferences, then, okay, it's good to call. It's okay to cold email. There's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure again, that message is really, really short and then attach a teaser. It doesn't need to be the full deck. It can just be a one pager or just a few pages, but just a teaser. Keep it small. Remember to compress it. Uh, but this way I can quickly read it. And if it grabs my attention, I'll click the, uh, the PDF. Uh, but you have to realize that investors are not going to be able to take a call with everybody that emails them. So you do need to capture their attention, which is the right intro, a founder, or that right sort of uh, you know, pitch that's short and compelling. So I think, Vinny, you have outlined it really well. I'm sure it's going to help all entrepreneurs, and uh, we're going to yeah. see some new innovations coming up post the COVID-19 period. Thank you for joining Cheers. us today. And uh, for the rest of our attendees, in case you have any more questions, please uh, reach out on our Facebook page, and we'll see if uh, Vinny or somebody from his team at Golden Gate Ventures could answer your questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Vinny. Sure, Thanks thank for you. your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.